Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So great to be back here in person. Good morning. I, my name is Bob Stein. I'm the Executive Director and Associate Vice Chancellor of the Institute for Entrepreneurial Excellence at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to our eighth State of the Economy program with our co-host, partner, and sponsor, PNC. We are so excited to be back here with you once again at the Tower at PNC. Two years into the pandemic, much is still changing, and we are returning to a new normal of work in society. I would like to thank Lou Sostello, Patrick Maley, and the entire PNC team for being our sustaining sponsor for nearly 30 years and coordinating this event. We are delighted for our lineup of speakers this morning. We have Acting Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, Secretary Neil Weaver. We have Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald, new City of Pittsburgh Mayor Edward Ganey. We have Allegheny Conference CEO Stephanie Pashman, PNC Regional President Lou Stello, and of course our keynote, PNC Chief Economist Gus Fauché. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Institute for Entrepreneurial Excellence, the IE has a mission of economic development for small businesses and entrepreneurs in Western Pennsylvania. As one of the region's leading business growth and support organizations, the IEE gives businesses the power to prosper by helping to increase their revenue, profitability, investment, adding or saving jobs, and increasing the number of the region's startups. In 2021, continuing with our second year of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are held to our mission and I've never been prouder of our results. In 2021, the IE has worked with nearly 2,000 businesses, supported almost 10,000 jobs, secured $22.5 million in new investment, and helped start 73 new businesses. We achieve all of this impact by providing consulting, education, and networking opportunities, and look forward to that continued impact for years to come. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors of today's event, PNC, Meyer, Unkovic & Scott, UPMC Health Plan, AT&T, Henderson Brothers, FedEx Ground, Wilkie & Associates, C-Leveled, and the Net Experts. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Lou Sestello. Sestello serves as the leader for the Pittsburgh and Southwest Pennsylvania market and leads PNC's regional president organization managing the re regional presidents across 43 markets. Lou? Thanks, Bob. It's great to see everybody in person. And uh, for those of you who could not be here today or in our live streaming, um, thank you for your support of the IEE and for PNC. We couldn't be more appreciative. Um, <clears throat> So I'll, I'll try to be brief, but it was almost exactly two years ago that we sent people home with COVID. It was March 13th, so it would be equivalent of this Friday. Um, you know, and it seems like I was just in here yesterday speaking to all of you, but so much has changed um, in the past couple of years. We have a new mayor, Ed. We're so, you know, excited that you're leading this city. You know, it's PNC's headquarters, and we could not be more proud to be here and look forward to your leadership. And Jake, who may be the hardest working guy. Uh, besides Ed in the room and Rich, um, you know, thank you for all you do for the region and for the city. Rich, thanks for all you do in, in support of, you know, the county and the city and, and PNC. It's been greatly appreciated. And Stephanie, thank you for your leadership as well. And Neil, look forward to, you know, many good years and driving small business together ahead. Um, <clears throat> so what's happened since uh, I was last on stage? Uh, let's see, there's been a two-year pandemic. Uh, we had PPP. Uh, PNC made a billion dollar commitment to help end systemic racism, and we made an $88 billion pledge uh, to try to help <clears throat> with economic empowerment across the United States and small businesses in particular, and low and moderate income you know, communities and, and areas. And um, we also bought a, a bank. We bought a $100 billion bank um, that was headquartered in the Southwest. And, um, you know, we've been hard at work growing PNC. We're one of only four national retail franchises, uh, banks across the country, but we are a Main Street bank, we're a domestic bank. We're very, very thrilled to come to work each and every day and support all of you, businesses like yours, small businesses, medium-sized businesses and large businesses, whether it be through treasury capabilities or lending capabilities. You know, we are kind of an old, boring bank. We're taking deposits, making loans, and trying to help this economy grow. And we're really, really proud to do it. And we're really proud to call Pittsburgh home. And Bob, thank you for the IEE and all you do. Small business is the backbone 
for you know making this community great and you know your leadership in the IEE's leadership along with the University of Pittsburgh is so greatly appreciated. You know, I encourage everybody to take advantage of the resources there, uh, take advantage of the resources that we have to offer at PNC to try to help you move forward financially. So with that, I'm going to kick it back to Bob. He's going to introduce the mayor, I believe, next, and um, or Neil and Neil. Yeah. Neil and um, thank you all for your support at PNC, and look forward to uh, a great year ahead of us. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Neil Weaver, Acting Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Economic Development. Secretary Weaver leads the Commonwealth's efforts to support business growth, strengthen the workforce, and revitalize communities. Neil? Good morning. So this is my 14th day on the job. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Secretary Dennis Davin for, for that. Uh, but Dennis always enjoyed uh, this event. Uh, I know it was uh, virtual last year, so it's great to have everyone uh, back together again. From our perspective at the Commonwealth level, while many Pres Pennsylvania residents and businesses alike are struggling with rising costs and labor challenges are still a central focus of many employers, we are encouraged by the upward trends we're seeing in some key economic indicators. As of December 2021, our current total number of non-farm jobs in Pennsylvania stands at just over 5.8 million. While lower than our pre-pandemic peak of more than 6 million, this number has been trending steadily upward since April of 2020. Pennsylvania's unemployment rate of 5.4% has followed similar direction of steadily approaching pre-pandemic levels. Our unemployment rate is significantly lower than competing neighbors like New York and New Jersey and comparable to others like Maryland and Delaware. On a positive note, Pennsylvania's GDP is surging at an all-time high of just under $850 billion. All of that has resulted in a healthy state budget surplus. With $9.2 billion in our general fund budget and the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue collections coming at nearly 12% above estimates in January. We are fortunate, in a fortunate position to having a two to three billion dollar budget surplus at the moment. And that's encouraging. And the Wolf administration will continue to invest in our business climate and infrastructure to ensure we are continuing to create jobs. After all, that is our charge at DCED and one that we take very seriously. But any discussion about the economic picture right now is incomplete if we don't discuss the labor force. Our labor force consists of just over 6.2 million individuals which is nearly 300,000 fewer than in March of 2020. There was a lot of speculation about labor shortages throughout the pandemic because people were afraid of getting sick, because unemployment benefits were too high, and many other theories. But now, as we are in a better position in terms of COVID case counts and hospitalizations, and temporary expanded unemployment benefits have gone away, we're still seeing these challenges continuing. We now know that it's not due to any single reason, but a number of reasons. And we also know that one of the best ways we can combat these challenges is by removing the barriers that people have to going back to work. Those barriers range from childcare, to transportation, to wages and benefits, to lack of training, and so much more. Businesses are facing other difficult problems right now, like supply chain issues, inflation, market unpredictability, as the global pandemic ebbs and flows. That's why in Governor Wolf's budget proposal he unveiled last month, he put forth several initiatives and investments focusing on our business climate, worker training and education, and beyond that will help our economy and get people back into the labor force. One of the biggest economic proposals in the budget is the governor's call to reduce the corporate net income tax, or CNIT. The proposal steps down the CNIT rate from the current 9.99%, which is the second highest in the nation to 5.99% by 2027, and a path to 4.99% after that. That's a rate lower than all but eight states with corporate net income taxes, and it will provide net tax cut for 95% of corporations operating here in Pennsylvania. The idea of this reduction is to take away the sticker shock that some businesses experience when exploring potential states in which to operate and seeing the Commonwealth CNIT. So not only will this help existing Pennsylvania businesses, 
but it will help attract new businesses who will bring investment and create new jobs, which is what we need. This proposal appears to have broad bipartisan uh, support at the moment, and we're feeling optimistic about it. Some other proposals in the budget that will help our economy are the $1.5 billion or million dollar increase in both the industrial resource centers and the Partnerships for Regional Economic Performance, or PREP. Pennsylvania's seven industrial resource centers provide technical assistance to the Commonwealth's manufacturing sector, especially to small and medium-sized manufacturers. Increasing the funding available to them will expand their ability to assist manufacturers with services like new product development, innovation engineering, market development, strategic planning, and lean manufacturing. The proposed increase for the PrEP partners will strengthen small businesses across the Commonwealth and bolster our business retention and expansion. The budget has several provisions to bolster our entrepreneurial ecosystem also, which is going to be crucial for our economic growth and the creation of jobs. Most notably, it proposes an $18 million increase for the Ben Franklin Technology Development Authority, which funds our four regional Ben Franklin Technology partners across Pennsylvania. The Ben Franklin partners have a strong reputation in the Commonwealth for fostering small technology-focused businesses and entrepreneurs through technical assistance and funding. The innovation economy is becoming a true powerhouse for Pennsylvania, and we see that here in Pittsburgh. So investing in the Ben Franklins is one of the best ways we can keep building that momentum and keep creating jobs. One final point I want to make is, as we all know, we have billions of dollars in the American Rescue Plan Fund sitting in our bank account not being put to use. The governor has a comprehensive plan to thoughtfully start spending those dollars. And the most relevant for us at DCD is the reinfusion of capital into our COVID relief small business assistance program. This grant program is for small businesses that we initially deployed in 2020. It received overwhelming response, including $1 billion worth of, uh, worth of requests. It was clear at the time that the $225 million we had for the program was just a drop in the bucket. So the governor has called for an additional $225 million of American Rescue Plan dollars to be put back in the program. Again, this money is sitting in just an account. This will bring some relief to 11,000 businesses to help them just not make ends meet, but to invest in their workers and their business to set them up for long-term success. We are feeling very optimistic about our budget situation this year, and I hope you found this quick recap I provided helpful. I truly believe that this budget, if passed as proposed, will strengthen our economy, help our businesses, and help get people back to work. I look forward to having a further conversation with each of you, and I think our economy is going in the right direction and exciting, excited for what the future holds. I want to thank you to the University of Pittsburgh Institute for Entrepreneurial Excellence and PNC for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for that encouraging news out of Harrisburg. And I must say, Neil, also, the DCD controls are part of our budget at the IE, so we appreciate your support. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald. As County Executive, Fitzgerald works with elected officials at all levels and with community leaders in business, labor, and philanthropy to help propel Allegheny County to commercial economic growth and prosperity. Rich? Thanks, Bob, and uh, thank you for the university for the great work that they continue to do. Uh, and like Lou, it's almost, uh, it was two years ago when we stood here talking about you know, the great momentum that Pittsburgh was experiencing, the Pittsburgh region. And obviously there's been a pause and the world changed uh, immensely in many, many ways. But I think in many ways, Pittsburgh is even poised even stronger in a stronger position right now uh, because of some of the changes that we have made and all of the uh, adjustments that, that have been made. And I think the nimbleness of what Pittsburgh has become puts us in a really, really good position to, uh, to come out of this in, in a good way. Uh, last year, we had uh, record numbers with our retail sales here in Allegheny County. Property values continue to go up as people continue to move in. And the, the good news that we heard late last year was the census numbers that came out and said that for the very first time in, since the 1950s, in over 60 years, that Allegheny County is actually growing again in population. Um, and more importantly, where we're growing is in our younger 
cohort of population. The 25 to 34 year old uh, age range, range grew at 20%, which is almost double the national average of 11%. So are, we're keeping our young people and more young people are coming here. We're also growing in diversity. Our Asian American population went up 80%, our Hispanic population went up 80%, and our mixed race population went up over 100%. So we're becoming younger, we're becoming more diverse, and we're becoming uh, more diverse economically as well as ethnically. Um, yesterday, there was a, a headline, uh, that a study that was done out of Washington, D.C., I don't know if you saw it, that Pittsburgh ranks, this was the headline, Pittsburgh ranks number two for growth in its creative economy class, and the boom may just be beginning. And it was quoted, some of the people that were quoted, Dr. Richard Florida, who many of you may remember when he was at CMU, says that really for the next 20 years, he sees Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh region continuing to grow. And we see that in exactly the type of uh, industries that are growing here uh, in the Pittsburgh region. Robotics, life sciences, as FinTech, I guess that's the new word, no finance anymore, you're FinTech. Uh, but our financial sector, our energy sector, with the world situation in Ukraine, we know that energy and energy production are gonna become critical. And you know, sitting on Marcellus Shale certainly puts us in a strong position. In addition to these great universities that we have that continue, uh, Pitt CMU, et cetera, that continue to turn out uh, entrepreneurial excellence with the new products and the new technologies that are being developed here and then staying here and will continue to be here. Um, and really what we need to continue to do is work together, work together as a community like we have over these last few years. There's a big infusion of in infrastructure money that's going to be coming down with the infrastructure law that passed late last year. And we've got to make sure that we use that infrastructure money and those investments to encourage good economic growth that is equitable for all. Uh, one of the things I think we, is a challenge for us is, you know, on a macro level, our economy is doing very, very well, but not everybody is enjoying the fruits of those, uh, of those labors, and we need to make sure that that, that occurs. So upskilling and giving people the, uh, the skills that they need to, to advance properly are all the things that we need to do. So I'm very bullish about where we're going uh, as an economy. I think we're in a really, really good position. Uh, we've got an energetic mayor you're going to hear from next who's uh, hit the ground running and is, and is getting out into the neighborhoods and making sure that all people are feeling part of this, uh, this resurgence that we're going to have. And I will also say it is good to see you all again in person. Um, as much as I like Zoom, actually I don't like Zoom to be honest with you, but as much as we had to rely on Zoom, it's still good to see people again. As we get back to normal, let's continue moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Rich, and I, we agree, uh, equitable growth for all is um, very important. I'd like to introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, Mayor of Pittsburgh, Ed Ganey. As Pittsburgh's 61st mayor and first black mayor, Ed has committed himself to bringing new leadership and vision and building trust in the diverse neighborhoods that make up the city. He will work every day to make Pittsburgh a city where all can belong and contribute. Mayor Ganey. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good morning. We can do better than that. We just came out of COVID. We back here together. Y'all sound like we still indoors. I mean, we indoors, but I'm talking about home indoors. Let's say this again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, there we go. There we go. I want to thank PNC. I want to thank the University of Pitt. Um, you know, I think that we're in a beautiful city that has tremendous opportunity. You know, I'm always amazed when I think about about how we transformed ourselves from a steel mill city to now we're looking at a city that in the next 20 years could be the leader in AI and robotics and finance and in everything else that moves this region forward. We are really successful in a lot of the things that we're doing. Life science has really taken off here and we have to find a way to continue to support that growth and development. When I look around and I think about cities that have went through difficult times, particularly in the Rust Belt, I'm amazed of how we have always been able to transform our economy and continue to grow. 
for that to every leader in this region, I thank you. Because without your vision, without your knowledge, without your wisdom, we would not have been able to transform this region like we have. We should pause right now and give yourself a, a nice round of applause. You know, people talk about where we going. And I always say that when you try to create it, it's a problem. When, when it's made for you, you can walk into it. And as we walk into this new economy, we continue to work together. There are things that we can do that's really going to help this region. One, out of our universities, we are able to recruit so many people to this region. Out of our job sectors, we are able to recruit. Workforce development, we are able to recruit so many people into this region. We don't have a problem recruiting. Matter of fact, we recruit well. What we have to work at is how do we retain that talent that we have here? What do we do to retain this talent? Because every business person I talk to talks about retaining talent here and not losing it to other cities. And that's where we have a massive opportunity. Our arts and culture community. People want to vibe downtown. They want to be able to come somewhere where it's a new vibe. It's hep to them as we continue to talk about this young professional development that is coming our way to keep them here. Our arts and, our arts and culture has to explode. We need to be more open to immigrants and refugees and people that's coming here because if they feel domestically that they can make Pittsburgh their home, then we grow in size, we grow in population, we grow in business development, and that's the investment that will move us forward. We have some stale, some stall make businesses that will always be here. Our sports teams, the Pirates, yes, the Pirates, the Steelers, yes, and the Penguins. Do you know how much we could bring here? They say the new economy is called tourism. We are primed to have a great tourism city. The catch is how do we do it? How do we come together? Today is International Women's Day. As a city, how do we celebrate that from a cultural standpoint? As an economy. The more we celebrate culture, the more we'll retain people and our investments will grow. But status quo can't grow, so we can't look at success. We got to look at growth. And growth only happens when everybody feels that they play a major part in moving this city forward. That's creating a city for all. That's what we have to focus on. How does everyone feel that they play a part here? Because if people can't buy in that they feel good about this city, that they want to stay, then our retention will still leave. And that's up to us. I want to retain and gain, never to lose. And that happens when you and I work together to ensure that we create a city where everybody feel welcome and everybody wants to work and play. And to my young people out there, I just want to say something. I know you're comfortable working from home. I know that. But let me just speak to you about growth. You can never become a president or a CEO from behind a computer at home, behind a laptop at home. Because you can manage anything, but there's a difference between managing and between leading. You can manage your job description and your job from home from a laptop. But to become the CEO or president, you have to learn to lead people. And that's only the process that you can learn when you come back to work. Thank you. I'm going to listen to that recording on my way to work every day. <laughs> It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Stephanie Pashman, CEO of the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. Pashman heads the Allegheny Conference and its affiliated organiz organizations, the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, the PA Economy League of Greater Pittsburgh, and the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance, dedicated to economic development and quality of life issues for a 10-county region in southwestern Pennsylvania. Stephanie? Tough act to follow, right? Well, it's wonderful to be with you all today, and thank you, Bob, and, and all of our um, incredible leaders from, from the public sector. 
I just have to make one comment um, acknowledging some of the struggle in our global economy in the Ukraine. Um, my grandmother actually is from the Ukraine, and I think this is personal for all of us. And what one of one of the things you might not know about Pittsburgh is that we have one of the highest concentrations of Ukrainians and Russians in our midst. So it's important we just remember our neighbors um, who are suffering. And um, just wanted to kind of make that comment before we start. So I may, um, I'm going to just make a few comments today on kind of where our economy is today um, at a high level. I know you'll hear much more from Gus Fauché. And then talk a little bit about how we're positioning for the future, uh, very much complementary to what you just heard from our incredible mayor and county executive. So we know about the unprecedented economic impact this um, this pandemic had on Southwestern PA. But just to put it into some perspective, employment fell by over 200,000 people between February and April 2020. In two months, 20%. If you know, when it, the steel collapse, that happened over two years and was only 100,000 jobs. So we lost twice as many jobs in just a couple months. So that's a pretty stark contrast to when we think about the dark days of, of steel. Um, this was actually worse. And in light of the sudden shock, our recovery has been somewhat remarkable. Um, we have, once we rich, rich, lifted restrictions uh, by the fall of 2020, we recovered more than 91% of our jobs from pre-pandemic levels. And today we're at 95%, which is pretty astounding. However, we are lagging behind national averages, which are 97% of pre-pandemic levels, and benchmark cities like the Austins, Nashville, Charlotte, Denver's, the ones we look at, um, their growth, it, they're back to kind of 98, 99% of pre-pandemic levels. And most of that is attributable to the um, efforts around talent retention and attraction that the mayor just commented on, and population growth more broadly. That is really our Achilles heel. On the talent front, we know that 4.5 million Americans have quit their jobs um, since, since uh, November 20, excuse me, in November 2021, which is pretty unbelievable. And this raises a lot of eyebrows. And in the region, we already have our challenges, and I know we're all feeling this in our companies. Um, we have population growth, yes, in Allegheny County, which you heard the county executive comment on, but unfortunately, the broader 10-county region in southwestern PA is still challenged, which leaves us pressured with a labor force, not population, but a labor force that is at its lowest level in three decades. But despite that, we are actually seeing some incredible economic activity, which is, an, which is kind of the, the commentary on how Pittsburgh makes things happen from, from even a, peri, a, a, a place of, of challenge. We create opportunity. So thinking about the new normal of business investment, which is one of the things we do at the conference, is try and bring businesses into the region, grow businesses that are here, and, and kind of bring jobs into our economy. So if you can track recent business investment announcements through the first four, nine months of 2021, we saw an increase in the proportion of now announcements in manufacturing, distribution, R&D, and headquarters and branch offices. And this shift in activity to these facilities, if these are the facilities that cannot be hybrid or remote. So we're growing jobs in areas where we actually can create office environments, where we can see the importance of businesses putting their production capabilities here, and this is a really positive trend for the region. As public and private sector leaders are, are thinking about these overall headwinds and the challenges post-pandemic, there's bigger issues we're thinking about as we position for the future. Um, and those are in three specific sectors, which you heard the mayor comment on, energy, robotics and autonomy and AI, and life sciences. So let me just comment for a minute about the energy space where our challenge is to in ensure prosperity for all while positioning for a lower carbon future. And from an asset perspective, we know our region is well positioned to do this. We are rich in natural resources, in production, including commercial nuclear energy, renewables, and we are also a leader, as we know, in electricity, oil, natural gas. But on top of that, one of the little known facts, and sitting in this um, green, one of the greenest buildings in the city, is that this region is an innovator in conservation, sustainability through green buildings and smart technologies. So taking that all together, it's an incredible opportunity for us. So we at the conference have been working with a pretty robust team of um, leaders and in industry experts to develop a regional strategy moving us towards a lower carbon future. At the same time, looking to drive investment and employment opportunity in an equitable way, as you talked, we talked about earlier. We wanted to find Southwestern PA with our comparative advantage, position ourselves to win, and make sure we get done that needs to get done to position ourselves for this lower carbon future. 
So moving on to talk a little bit about robotics um, and AI, these are technologies that will be the mainstay technologies of our future economy. In this region alone, autonomous mobile systems are anticipated to be a one trillion, excuse me, overall a one trillion dollar global market by 2026. And we expect about 5,000 jobs and $10 billion of economic impact for the region if we can capture just 1% of that market growth. We are positioned to dominate in this field, and we, are, we have a position that is actually unassailable um, in our national space. To cement our position um, in the robotics and AI space, we've actually come together to create a robust build out of our cluster strategy and are pursuing um, an economic development innovation at the federal level, Build Back Better Regional Cluster Challenge Grant, partnering with 11 counties to bring $100 million in funding to this region. Um, at least we're hoping we get $1 million, $100 million in this cluster. If we are successful, we'll catalyze the federal investment. This federal investment will catalyze our power to spread this opportunity, create more jobs, more importantly, we wanted, the whole point of this grant is to make sure that this growth is inclusive. While there are 80 and 90 companies in robotics in our urban core, we wanna spread the opportunity across the 11 county region, ensure that our SMEs are adopting these technologies and make sure that we are creating and leveraging the middle skills jobs opportunities for people from rural neighborhoods, from black and brown neighborhoods and from people throughout the broader economy. As a region, we are also coming together to actively support university and partner efforts to grow the life sciences cluster. In recent years, our region has been recognized as a top emerging life sciences hub for the first time ever. And with the right policies and investments in innovation, real estate, infrastructure, we know we can lead globally as well. For example, what's being developed with biomanufacturing powerhouse at Hazelwood Green, coupled with policy improvements that we are looking at um, at the state level, could unlock cutting edge biomedical research and world class clinical care to position us in life sciences as well. So as we think about this post-pandemic world, while there may be some challenges in the numbers and the trends, we believe the build out of these clusters and the way we are positioning this region for the future growth will strengthen our capacity as an innovation hub, make the region more attractive to talent, and generate the economic benefits we all want to see for a, a future new generation economy for all. So I'm pleased to be with you today. Um, I hope that framing helps a bit as you contextualize what you're going to hear later from Gus. And thank you all um, for inviting me to, to share these remarks. <clears throat>
something external to the economy, the coronavirus pandemic. When I spoke to you in early 2020, I said, look, the economic fundamentals are good. We expect the U.S. economy will continue to expand throughout 2020. At that point, we were starting to uh, watch what was going on with the virus that was emerging in China at the time, uh, but the economy looked good. And instead, we had this external hit that caused a very severe downturn. But the good news is, is that we are well into an economic recovery, uh, almost two years, uh, and that conditions, although obviously there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding Ukraine and inflation and so forth, the conditions still look pretty solid in the U.S. economy right now. Um, when the pandemic hit, we saw a very swift response from the Federal Reserve. They cut short-term interest rates very quickly. You can see the blue line is the interest rate on the three-month Treasury bill, what it costs the federal government to borrow for three months, and that fell from 1.5% to zero as the Fed aggressively cut rates. And then the Fed said, hey, we need to do more to support the economic recovery. So we're going to try to push down longer term interest rates as well. So the Fed started to buy long term treasuries. They started to buy mortgage backed securities. That's why the interest rate on a 30 year fixed rate mortgage fell below 3% in 2020. Uh, that's why the yield on a 10 year treasury note, what it costs the federal government to borrow for 10 years, fell from close to 2% in early 2020 to well below 1%. And that helps support the economic recovery that is underway, those very low borrowing costs. Now, we're almost two years into a recovery. We have strong job growth. We have high inflation. So the Fed is getting ready to reduce some of the support it has provided to the economy. And you can see that long-term rates have been moving up for you know, a little more than a year now. Short-term rates have started to move up more recently as it's become apparent that the Federal Reserve is getting ready to raise the Fed funds rate, their key short-term rate. But this is good. This is an indication that the economy is doing well and the Fed feels comfortable reducing some of the policy, policy support it has provided to the economy. That being said, we have seen a negative reaction in the stock market to recent events, but that has followed a period of very, very strong growth. So the blue bars, the S&P 500, that's a measure of stock prices, broad-based basket. And you can see that stock prices fell by about a third in early 2020 as the pandemic came to the United States. But since then, have grown very, very strongly as the economy has recovered, as we've received stimulus, as the pandemic, you know, it's ebbed and flowed. Uh, but we've, you know, through much of the second half of 2020, throughout 2021, we saw record high stock prices. And the stock market is not a measure of how things look on February. February, let's say the 6th, the 8th? March. March, gosh. Um, it's going quickly. Uh, but it's not a measure of, uh, of where things are today. It's a measure of where things are going to be over the next few years. Where markets think the economy is going to be, where corporate profitability in particular is going to be a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. And even with the decline in stock prices that we've seen over the past few months because of higher interest rates, because of Ukraine, uh, still far, far higher than they were before the pandemic. And markets are pointing to continued expansion in the U.S. economy in the years ahead. Uh, the orange line is the VIX index. That's a measure of how much stock prices are moving up and down. You can see that enormous spike in volatility in early 2020 as the pandemic came to the United States. Um, still elevated in 2020, much of 2021. We had a lot going on. We had the pandemic. We had the presidential election. We had stimulus and so forth. And then you can see the increase in volatility more recently, again, as the Fed has been getting ready to raise interest rates and now with Ukraine, but still much, much lower than it was at the worst of the pandemic. And again, I think that's indicative of the positive view that economic markets have of where the economy is going to be going over the next few years. Um, Stephanie talked about the labor market. We lost 22 million jobs in the U.S. economy in two months. Compare that to the Great Recession, which was the worst downturn in the U.S. economy since the Great Depression, and we lost 8 million jobs over two years. So much, much larger job losses in a much shorter period of time.
The good news is, is that we have added back about 20 million jobs. The bad news is, is that means we're still down by about 2 million jobs from where we were before the pandemic. Now, we did get some good news recently. The Bureau of Labor Statistics revised their employment data. They indicate that job growth in late 2021, early 2022 has been better than initially reported. You know, we're adding 500,000 jobs a month, so a very strong pace there. But we are still in a hole, and yet at the same time, businesses say that they are having difficulty in finding workers. How many of you are trying to hire and are having difficulty in finding the workers that you need? All right. So, um, you know, it is a tight labor market out there because the labor force has gotten smaller with the pandemic. So this line is the labor force participation rate. This is the share of adults who are either working or looking for work. And I want to make a few points here. First of which is that you can see that it's been falling over time because of the aging of the baby boomers. So as the baby boomers have entered into retirement, they have dropped out of the labor force and that has pushed down the labor force participation rate. You can also see that at least you know, for much of the uh, first uh, decade of this century, that the labor force participation rate in Pennsylvania was below the national rate. Now, we had an enormous drop in the labor force participation rate with the pandemic for a few reasons. Part of it was there were some people who were approaching retirement who maybe had planned on working for a few more years. The pandemic hit, they decided to drop out of the labor force. Some of it is due to child care concerns. Child care centers are closed. Virtual schooling has made it difficult for many working parents. So they've dropped out of the labor force. Um, some of it is concern about catching the coronavirus, either for yourself or exposed a family member. And some of it is, is government assistance was more generous with the pandemic and perhaps some people are being a bit choosier in taking a job coming out of the pandemic and so that's weighed on the labor force participation rate. You can see that it's come back nationally. It's still lower in Pennsylvania so this is a particular problem in, in, this, in the Commonwealth. But the key takeaway is, is that the labor force now is structurally smaller than it was before the pandemic. We have about nationally about one million fewer people working or looking for work compared to before the pandemic. And that is just making it very difficult for businesses to hire right now. And that's why we're seeing all these help wanted signs. That's why we're seeing strong wage growth. That's why we're seeing businesses cutting back on their hours because they can't find the workers. And I think this is going to be a permanent shift in the labor force, that perhaps some of those people may be coming back into the labor force over the next six, 12 months or so as the pandemic hopefully recedes, but the businesses need to think about new strategies to adjust to a world where there is a structurally smaller labor force. And you can see that this problem is particularly acute in Pennsylvania. Now, don't Take those as gospel, the, the state numbers in particular are um, you know, perhaps not as precise as the national numbers, but I think it is fair to say that the labor force shortage in Pennsylvania is more acute than it is nationally. This shows three measures of economic activity. I set the peak before the pandemic equal to 100. These are all adjusted for inflation, so GDP, output of goods and services, that's the broadest measure that we have. Um, I also show the green line is final sales to domestic product, that's GDP minus the change in inventories that measures demand in the U.S. economy. And then finally, the orange line is gross domestic income, that's an alternative measure of the size of the economy, looks at the income going to households and businesses from economic activity, so it excludes transfer payments. You can see that based Basically, between the fourth quarter of 2019 and the second quarter of 2020, the U.S. economy contracted by about 10%. We were producing 10% fewer goods and services at the worst of the downturn than we were before the pandemic. Look at the Great Recession, which again was a bad downturn. There we saw real GDP decline by 4% over six quarters. So this was a much steeper contraction in economic activity over a much shorter period of time.
Now, the good news is, is that output now is actually above its pre-pandemic level. So the economy is larger than it was before the pandemic. We have had a very, very strong rebound, but it has been uneven across sectors in the economy. So the blue bars here, this shows the change in activity between the fourth quarter of 2019 before the pandemic to the second quarter of 2020 when things were at their worst, again, adjusted for inflation. The orange bars are the change between the fourth quarter of 2019 and then the fourth quarter of 2021, the latest reading that we have. And so we've seen, we can see that the recovery has been uneven across sectors. So initially, consumer spending on services, and this is a very broad category, it includes education and health care, it includes personal financial services, uh, it includes travel and tourism, it includes um, uh, things like uh, restaurants, child care, those, all those types of things. That fell by about 15% initially is still down slightly below its pre-pandemic level. So in aggregate, as consumers, we are spending less on services now than we did before the pandemic. On the other hand, look at consumer spending on goods, either durable goods, which are big ticket items like cars and appliances, or non-durable goods meant to last fewer than three years, food, clothing, medications, gasoline. And again, these are adjusted for inflation. Well above their pre-pandemic level. So as consumers, we are buying a lot more goods now than we did before the pandemic. And that's why we're having all of these supply chain difficulties because our economy is not set up, was not set up to produce this many goods. And so that's why we're having shortages, that's why we're having production delays, all of that. Very strong consumer spending on goods. Um, business investments, you can see that that fell by about 10% initially, is now slightly above its pre-pandemic level. And that is even accounting for the fact that we have been investing less in various types of commercial real estate, in particular office buildings and hotels because of the, the, the pandemic. Residential investment. Single-family housing, multi-family housing, repairs and renovations. How many of you have fixed up your home because you're, you know, you're working at home, your spouse is working at home, your kids are being schooled at home? How many of you have, have you know, made renovations on your house? Mayor Ganey has, okay. Stephanie has. Um, 30-year fixed mortgage rate below 3%. Look at that. You know, a 13 14% increase in investment in housing because of since the pandemic. And so again, that has really supported the economic recovery that is underway. Uh, you can see that exports fell tremendously, fell by about a quarter with the pandemic, still below their pre-pandemic level. The, economy, the recoveries in other economies have been slower than in the United States, so exports have not fully recovered. On the other hand, imports 10% above their pre-pandemic level. A lot of what we have been buying have been imported goods. And again, that helps explain production shortages, supply chain difficulties. Uh, we're buying more imported goods than we were before the pandemic. It's leading to shipping delays, all of that, and that has helped contribute to the higher inflation that we're seeing in the economy. And then finally, these bars at the bottom, this is the key to the entire thing. After-tax personal income. This is income from the labor market, it's income from investments, it's income from uh, transfer payments from the government. So you can see that between the second quarter, uh, fourth quarter of 2019, and the second quarter of 2020, that jumped more than 10%. Now remember, we lost 22 million jobs in that period. So we lost all of the income associated with those jobs. That was wiped out. And yet, household income actually increased. What was going on? Well, the federal government stepped in and provided stimulus payments to households. They made more people eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. They increased the level of unemployment insurance benefits. So household income actually went up, and that's what's allowed people to go out and buy a new car or to renovate their home or to put a down payment on a new home. And that has really caused the economic recovery that is underway to get started. 
And so that has made an enormous difference in the economy. And the good news is, is that even with high inflation, that consumers will continue to spend in 2022, 2023. So the blue line on the left-hand scale, that is the personal saving rate. That is the share of after-tax income that households are saving. Couple things to point out. First of which is even before the pandemic, that personal savings rate was much higher than it was heading into the Great Recession. So households, even before this economic downturn, were in better shape heading into it than they were before the previous recession. And then look what happened to that savings rate in 2020, 2021. What was going on? Well, you had more income from the government through transfer payments. At the same time, you couldn't spend anything. You weren't going on vacation. You weren't going out to eat dinner. And so households saved up a lot of money. And the latest estimates I've seen are that there is an extra two and a half trillion dollars that consumers have saved up relative to before the pandemic. That's a huge amount of money. And what that means is, is that even with higher inflation, as the job market recovery continues, households have a lot of extra money saved up that they will be spending over the next couple of years as the pandemic hopefully recedes, as they feel more comfortable going out. And in particular, they will be spending a lot of that on services rather than goods. So we've bought a lot of goods. We don't need as many goods now, but we will be spending more on services going forward. And also, household balance sheets are in excellent shape. So the orange line on the right-hand scale, that's the financial obligations ratio. That's the share of after-tax income uh, that households are spending on mortgage payments, rents for renters, homeowners insurance, property taxes, auto loans and leases, credit card payments, student loan payments, all of those types of things. Um, you can see that that is extremely low right now. Some of it was aid from the government, which increased income. Some of it is things like debt moratoriums and so forth. But household balance sheets are in great shape, which means as the recovery proceeds, households have the ability to borrow to finance their purchases. And with consumer spending making up about two-thirds of the U.S. economy, these very good household balance sheets mean that consumer spending growth, economic growth, should be solid in 2022-2023. Another big support to the economy going forward will be the need to rebuild inventories. Uh, how many of you out there have inventories that are too low? You could either sell more if you had more inventories, or you can't get the inputs that you need. All right, I see a few hands going up. Um, but as supply chains normalize business, this shows inventories relative to sales in the U.S. economy. It's extremely low right now, especially given that the economy is growing strongly. So businesses will need to rebuild their inventories, and that will be a big support to economic growth in 2022, 2023. I've mentioned the stimulus. That has made an enormous difference in the economy. Um, you can see that big chunk up there, about $1.2 trillion. That's a paycheck protection program that Lou mentioned. That provided very low interest uh, rate loans to small businesses. Those loans actually turn into grants if those businesses meet certain requirements in terms of keeping workers on their payroll. Uh, I'm on the board of a small nonprofit here in Pittsburgh that provides transitional housing to veterans. Um, we received two rounds of PPP funding. Uh, the, we've uh, received forgiveness on the first round. We've applied for forgiveness on the second round. But that has allowed many small and medium-sized businesses to stay open through the worst of the pandemic uh, and then kind of reopen on the other side. For, for those of you in our audience, how many of you did any of you receive PPP loans? Okay. We did a survey and we found that of those businesses that received PPP loans, three quarters said it was extremely important to their survival of their business, and another 20% said it was somewhat important. So that made a huge difference in the economic recovery. 
Stimulus payments, these are the, the checks that many households received in early 2020 and then again in early 2021, an extra $800 billion. Uh, aid to states, states haven't needed to make the same budget cuts this time around that they did during the last recession and that has really supported the economic recovery. Extra unemployment insurance benefits, more people were made eligible, independent contractors, gig workers like Uber and Lyft drivers, the self-employed, and also the level of unemployment insurance benefits was increased. That provided an extra $600 billion in aid to households, although those, those, those extra benefits expired in September of last year. Um, aid to big businesses, the airlines, and so forth. But all of this aid has made an enormous difference and has really jump-started the recovery that is underway. Now, some of you are probably saying to yourself, well, that's great, Gus, but can we afford this? My answer is we couldn't have afforded not to do this. Think back, we lost 22 million jobs. Imagine if those people who lost those jobs had been forced to cut back on their spending. What would the economic recovery would have looked look like. The recession would have been much longer, much deeper. And so that aid from the federal government has made an enormous difference and has really supported the recovery, the strong recovery that we're enjoying here in the United States. Now, you can see the orange line on the right-hand scale. That is federal debt as a share of the size of the economy. It hit about 100% at the worst of the downturn, not actually a record high for the U.S., the record high in the United States. Anybody know when that was? It's coming out of World War II, 1946. And I would make the argument that World War II represented an existential threat to the United States. And the pandemic that we faced in 2020 was also an existential threat to the United States. And it makes sense that the federal government would step in and provide support to the economy at a time when it was extremely weak. Now, you can see that that debt level as a share of the size of the economy is declining, both because we're spending less on these pandemic-related programs, but also because the economy is actually expanding now. But the key thing is the blue line on the left-hand scale. That is Federal interest payments on the debt is a share of the size of the economy. And it actually is very low right now, even with all of that debt the federal government has taken on. Interest rates that the federal government is paying are extremely low right now. Remember that chart that I showed you at the beginning? And in fact, interest payments on the federal debt are much smaller than they were back in the 1980s and the 1990s. So the United States government is not having any difficulties now in financing its debt, and given especially the very low borrowing costs that the federal government faces, it makes sense that the federal government stepped in very aggressively during the downturn. You're also probably saying to yourself, well, what about inflation? And inflation is a real concern in the U.S. economy right now. But there are different types of inflation. So the blue line is the producer price index for intermediate unprocessed goods. These are the raw materials that businesses sell to other businesses. So this is things like crude oil, iron ore, raw timber, that type of thing. Couple points to make here. First of all, yes, that has been extremely high. It was about 60% year over year in late 2020. Now, we are starting to see inflation slow at the wholesale level. Uh, and in fact, we have seen price declines for many goods that were initially in short supply. So if you think the, the news stories a year or so ago about timber prices, they've actually fallen a lot since then as the economy has adjusted. And also, we experienced a similar period of high wholesale inflation coming out of the last recession, not as high as it was this time around, but not unprecedented. The orange line is the producer price index for intermediate processed goods. So these are goods that businesses sell to other goods and they're finished. So this is things like, uh, you know, finished steel, computer chips, and so forth. And again, you can see that Inflation there has been high, although it appears to have peaked, and that we did experience a similar, albeit lower, period of high inflation coming out of the last uh, a recession during the early stages of the economic recovery. 
And then finally, the green line is what the Federal Reserve is most focused on. This is the personal consumption expenditures price index. This excludes food and energy prices, which can bounce around a lot. Um, and this is the goods and services that we buy every day. Don't forget, as consumers, we buy more services than we do as goods. Things like education, health care, and so forth. And you can see that, yes, inflation there is picked up. It's higher than the Federal Reserve would like, but certainly to a much smaller extent than wholesale inflation. And so the Fed is concerned about high inflation. The Fed is watching that. But I don't want to, and, and we've had the highest inflation rate in, you know, since the early 1980s. Um, but that relative to wholesale inflation, it's not nearly as bad. And we are starting to see the Federal Reserve respond to that. So, for example, I mentioned at the top the Federal Reserve buying all of those long-term treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Uh, the long-term treasuries are the orange bars. The mortgage-backed securities are the uh, blue bars. And you can see that the Fed has been buying those to push down long-term interest rates. But now that the economy is recovering, the labor market is good, um, the Fed has wrapped up those purchases, so it will not be buying any more long-term treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. That's why we've seen mortgage rates in increase. That's why we've seen long-term interest rates increase, because the Fed has said, hey, we've done our part. And, in fact, we will see the Fed start to raise short-term interest rates in next week. Uh, a week from Wednesday, the Federal Open Market Committee will meet, they will raise the Fed funds rate, their key short-term interest rate, by a quarter of a percentage point. Right now, it's between zero and a quarter of a percent. They'll raise it up to between a quarter percent and a half of a percent. And that is going to be the start of a process where the Fed will be raising short-term interest rates in an effort to cool off economic growth and bring inflation back down to their tar long-run target. And so we will be seeing the Fed gradually raising interest rates in an effort to cool off growth and in, in an effort to slow inflation. And I, if I were you, I would not bet against the Federal Reserve. They have made it clear that they want inflation to slow over the longer run. So who can tell me what the Federal Reserve's long-term inflation objective is? What do they want inflation to be over the long run? 2%. 2%, Okay. This is what, this is not actual inflation. This is what financial markets think inflation will be five to ten years in the future. This is based on the difference in returns between regular treasury securities and then what we call TIPS, treasury inflation protected securities. They pay a rate of return plus whatever inflation turns out to be. And if you look at that, and Olivia, you're in front, so I'll ask you. So what does, the, right now, what do financial markets think inflation is going to be five to ten years in the future, between early 2027 and early 2032? Two percent. Okay. So I'm telling you that inflation is going to be two percent over the long run. Financial markets are telling you that inflation will be two percent over the longer run, that the Fed will do its job and will bring inflation back down to two percent, that they are on the job. We're, you know, we are experiencing some dislocation in the economy. Uh, we've had very strong demand coming out of the pandemic. Now we have the issue with Ukraine and high energy prices and so forth. But the Fed has made it clear, Chair Powell has made it clear that they will do what is necessary to raise interest rates to slow economic growth enough that over the long run, inflation gets back to that 2% objective. Okay. So given that even with everything that's going on with Ukraine and so forth, consumer balance sheets are in good shape, households have that extra $2.5 trillion uh, saved up, Businesses will be investing in order to get more, of their, get more out of their existing workforces given the tight labor supply and so forth. So we think that the economic recovery will proceed throughout 2022 and 2023. So this is real GDP growth. You can see this enormous contraction that we experience is very strong recovery. And we think that economic growth will gradually slow over the course of 2022 as households spend down that money they've saved up, as higher interest rates 
weigh on economic growth somewhat as high inflation weighs on economic growth somewhat, but that the recovery will continue throughout 2022, throughout 2023, and that the labor market will continue to improve. The unemployment rate was 3.5% before the pandemic. It jumped up to almost 15% in April of 2020 when things were at their worst. That was the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression back in the 1930s. Uh, as of February, it was 3.8%, so very low right now. And the unemployment rate will continue to decline. In the second half of this year, it will be back at that 3.5% pre-pandemic level, may even get a little bit below that, but will settle in at, you know, 3.5%, 4% over the long run. So continued improvement in the labor market as well. But I do think that the crisis in Ukraine does add some downside risk to the outlook, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this shows various measures of economic activity. I set the peak before the pandemic equal to 100. So real GDP, output of goods and services, you can see that again, now that is above its pre-pandemic level and will continue to improve in 2022, 2023, albeit at a somewhat slower pace. Business investment, again, slightly above its pre-pandemic level now. That will lead economic growth over the next couple of years as businesses invest. In particular, with um, the smaller labor force, they're going to invest in technologies that make their workers more productive. Uh, employment has been lagging, not back to its pre-recession peak. Will be there in mid-2022, uh, and then will continue to improve over the course of 2023 as well as the economy continues to add jobs. Um, industrial production, output of manufacturers, mines, and utilities. You can see that that actually peaked before the pandemic, in late 2018, early 2019, fell very sharply, has recovered, but not quite back to its pre-pandemic level. But that will, again, uh, return to its pre-pandemic level sometime later this year, and then continue to grow. And then finally, housing starts. You can see that those fell dramatically with the pandemic, but uh, really came back very strongly with strong demand, particularly for single-family homes. Um, now about, what, 15% above its pre-pandemic level. will continue to improve in 2023 before slowing, uh, 2022, excuse me, before slowing in 2023 with higher interest rates, higher mortgage rates. Uh, but that has been a big contributor to the recovery that is underway. Um, as I mentioned, however, we are following the situation in Ukraine and its potential impact on the U.S. economy. Um, first of all, the direct impact from Russia on the U.S. economy is minimal. Uh, this is the share of global GDP. You can see that uh, the U.S. is about a quarter. Uh, Russia, less than 2%. Um, if you look at exports to Russia for the United States, they're a rounding error in GDP. So the direct impact of Russia is minimal on the U.S. economy. What I'm much more concerned about is the impact on Western Europe. Uh, so the euro area makes up about 15% of uh, global GDP. The UK makes up another 3%. Uh, they are heavily exposed to what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so I am concerned that the conflict there could cause much weaker growth in Europe uh, perhaps an outright recession in Europe, and that could weigh on U.S. exports to the region and could be a significant drag, particularly given that the Eurozone is heavily dependent on Russia for energy. So you can see that overall about 60, per, the Eurozone gets about 60% of its energy uh, from outside the Eurozone, much of that, not all of it, but much of that is from Russia. Uh, and then for some of the major Eurozone economies like Germany, Italy, Spain, it's an even higher percentage. And so they are heavily exposed to higher energy costs. They are heavily exposed to Russian uh, imports from Russia of oil, of natural gas. And so the conflict in Ukraine Ukraine could have a very significant impact on European economic growth, and that would be a big drag on the U.S. economy going forward. Um, 
there's a great deal of uncertainty out there, but here is what I'm pretty sure about. So we did experience a very steep recession in 2020, uh, but that we have enjoyed a strong recovery and that the recovery will continue in 2022 and 2023. But we have seen structural shifts in the U.S. economy. So we've seen a movement away from traditional retailing towards online sales. Obviously, that process was already underway, but accelerated with the pandemic. That is not going to reverse itself. Uh, we've seen shifts in supply chains. So businesses are keeping more inventory on hand that instead of sourcing supplies from Asia, perhaps they're sourcing from within the United States or at least from within North America, and that those are going to be permanent changes. And then finally, we're seeing shifts in commercial real estate markets. So with more people working from home, we have less structural demand for office space, uh, but we have more demand for uh, less structural demand for retail space, but more demand for warehousing, transportation, distribution space because of the increasing prevalence of online sales. But there are still a lot of open questions. Um, so what happens with the impact of Ukraine? How long are these high oil prices going to last? What does that mean for inflation in the United States? What does it mean for the Federal Reserve in the United States? States? Does the Fed needs, need to raise interest rates even more aggressively because higher energy prices lead to higher broad-based inflation in the U.S. economy? And it does increase the probability that the Fed could make a mistake. Now, again, our baseline forecast is for continued growth, expansion in the United States economy, but perhaps the Fed raises rates too quickly in response to high, to high inflation, and that leads to a much more significant slowing in economic growth. Their task has gotten, and it was already difficult, it's gotten even more difficult with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. What happens with the pandemic? Hopefully, we're, we've seen the worst of it, but We've seen variants arise before. They could come back. We could see uh, states, localities start to place restrictions on economic activity again. Um, the Build Back Better plan, the forecast that I showed you, did include the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed Congress late last year that President Biden signed. It does not include the Build Back Better program. Um, and that certainly, you know, the, that does have some potential upside risks that it could increase labor supply in the economy, support economic growth. On the other hand, it contains tax increases that could weigh on economic growth. Uh, so we would, if it looks close to the passage, we would have to start including that in our forecast. What's the impact of the pandemic on longer run economic growth? I am hopeful that the pandemic has not caused long run damage to the economy, but certainly there could be big structural changes that could mean the rate of economic growth in the future is lower because of the pandemic. And then finally, the housing market. We've seen big changes in the housing market. We've seen people move from apartments to single family homes. We've seen people move from the cities to the suburbs or to uh, more rural areas. Do we think that those shifts are going to be permanent? What's going on with the movement away from jobs in office, in person, to more remote work. And what does that mean for the housing market? What does it mean for regional economic conditions? And speaking of which, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the Pittsburgh area. This is the Philadelphia Fed's coincident index. So this is from February of 2020. This is how things looked then. Um, you can see, remember at the top when I said, hey, things looked pretty good. We were not expecting a big economic downturn. Most of the country was in economic expansion in early 2020, including Pennsylvania. You go forward to May of 2020, not a whole lot to like there. Uh, every state is in that deep red contractionary category. Um, and that is very different from other recessions in the United States. Usually there are one or two pockets of the economy that, were ho that are holding up. That was not the case this time around. But this is the latest coincident index. This is from December of last year. And you can see that the entire country is in expansion, good, solid expansion, including Pennsylvania. So the entire economy, all the states are enjoying solid economic growth at the end of 2021. Um, let's take a look at employment. And I set the peak in employment before the pandemic equal to 100. Uh, we've got 
uh, the U.S., we've got Pennsylvania, and then this is the Pittsburgh metropolitan area. So this is Allegheny, Armstrong, Beaver, Butler, Fayette, Washington, and Westmoreland counties, the seven-county region. Couple things to point out, first of which is, is that you can see that job growth before the pandemic in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh was weaker than what we were experiencing nationally. The downturn was more severe in Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania, and in part that's because the state imposed more restrictions on economic activity than other, some other states did. And although there has been a solid economic recovery and good job growth in Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania, that we are still lagging compared to the rest of the country. That nationally employment is down by about 3% from before the pandemic. Locally, it's closer to 5%. And so the recovery is not as complete in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh as it is in the rest of the country. Part of that is that labor force issue that we were talking about. Remember, the labor force participation rate has not come back as strongly in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh as it has in the rest of the country. So the worker shortage is more acute here than it is in other parts of the United States. Um, we've also experienced a very strong house price cycle in Pittsburgh and in the, uh, Pennsylvania, but not as strong as what we've experienced nationally. So you can see that, you know, in, as I mentioned, very strong demand for single family homes, but we have seen price appreciation in Pittsburgh peak um, uh, ahead of the United States and at a lower uh, pace than in the United States. So house prices are still increasing in Pittsburgh, but not as quickly. Um, the Pittsburgh market has fewer supply constraints than the rest of the country. So um, we've been able to put up supply more quickly in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, with uh, slower population growth, the underlying demand isn't quite as strong for housing in the Pittsburgh area as it is in other parts of the country. And so we have seen house price grow slow in Pittsburgh. Um, I don't think we're at risk of a major correction in the Pittsburgh housing market. Um, we don't have oversupply issues. Lenders have been responsible. Borrowers have been responsible. That's very different from the situation that we had, you know, a dozen years ago during the housing boom and bust cycle. So I would expect we'll see continued slowing in Pittsburgh area house price growth going forward as mortgage rates continue to increase. And then finally, we've discussed this a lot, and Executive Fitzgerald mentioned it this morning, the increase in population in Allegheny County. Again, this is the seven-county metropolitan area, not just Pitts, the city of Pittsburgh, not just Allegheny County, uh, but population has been declining for about a decade now. Uh, that makes it difficult for businesses to find workers. Uh, that makes it difficult for consumer-oriented businesses. That makes it difficult for residential construction. So this is the key. Can we build on that population growth that Executive Fitzgerald mentioned, particularly among young people? Can we can attract them? Um, you know, we do have some advantages coming out of the pandemic. Our housing costs are much lower than in other parts of the country. With the increasing prevalence of remote work, uh, perhaps we can bring people from higher cost East Coast metro areas to the Pittsburgh area. Um, but, uh, you know, we do have an older population. We do have some structural impediments. And this is going to be the key to long run economic growth uh, in the United States. Um, you can find our materials at pnc.com slash economic reports. Uh, we have a write up up there now that talks about the impact of the Ukrainian, uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine on the U.S. economy. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Gus Fauche PNC. Bob, I think we have time for questions which is, that's the thing I've missed most about doing virtual presentations is questions. And do we have the ability to take questions from people online as well? Great. All right. So let's do that. So uh, either if you're in the audience here or if you're, uh, if you're watching at home, but I would be happy to take any questions that people have. Thank you very much. Oh, we've got a couple back there. Right now? Yep. Oh, hi. Hi, Gus. What's PNC's take on the office commercial real estate in the next, like, five years? I, I just see tenants can't pay their rent, landlords who can't pay their mortgage, and kind of curious on where you guys see that going from a risk standpoint. Okay, let me make it clear that what I'm about to say is not PNC's view on this. This is a national 
Oh, and, and a local economic view. I don't know if Lou has any additional thoughts that, uh, that uh, I'll invite him up after I say what I'm going to say. Um, you know, I think that we have a lower level of structural demand for office space in the U.S. economy now than we did before the pandemic. Um, we just, uh, I mean, employment is still down from its pre-pandemic level. Uh, and people just are not going to be in the office as much as they were previously. Um, some people who are in the office are going to be uh, working from home full time. Uh, other people, and, and I think we're a good example of this here, we are going to be in the office, per, but perhaps not 100% of the time. Um, and so I think there is going to be a lower structural demand for office space in the U.S. economy uh, compared to before the pandemic. And th I think it's going to take some time for the office market to adjust to that. Uh, and so I think that conditions will be difficult. We've seen office values, uh, property values hold up pretty well, perhaps surprisingly well, uh, but we have seen a downturn in office related construction activity. And I think it's going to be a difficult few years until the market sorts itself out and people figure out how much they're going to be working at home versus how much they're going to be working at the office. Lou, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, so uh, Lou, Lou is saying it's going to be like Rubik's Cube where you have all these moving pieces and we're still not sure where it's going to end up coming out. So, Gus, uh, can you comment on just the destructive slash disruptive uh, singular issue of the cost of oil, the sources of it, and at the pump? So the, the question is about the impact of the cost of higher costs of oil and energy in general uh, on the economic outlook. Um, so uh, this has all happened so quickly, and, and I'll, I'm going to add some energy slides to this presentation as, as, as we go forward. Um, but um, first of all, the good news is, is that the U.S. economy is much less exposed to higher energy costs now than it was in the past. As the economy has moved away from manufacturing towards service industries, what we call the energy intensity of the U.S. economy, the amount of energy required to produce a certain amount of input, has declined dramatically. So higher energy prices in 2022 are going to be significantly less of a drag than they were 20 or 40 years ago. Now, that being said, they are still going to be a significant drag. We, we're talked, we talked about how inflation is high. Inflation is going to pick up even more in the near term. Uh, I think that it will cause consumers to cut back on Consumer spending will continue to grow, but at a slower pace than we might have been expecting a couple of months ago, because consumers, it's going to take more to heat their homes, it's going to take more to fill up their gas tanks and so forth. Um, I do think that, first of all, I'm hopeful that the impact will not last, you know, more than six, nine months. Obviously, that depends on how the situation goes with Russia and Ukraine and so forth, uh, but I'm hopeful that there will be a... a quick resolution to the conflict that will help restore some normalcy in energy markets. Um, the other thing is that I do think that we will see increased supply of energy uh, as, um, you know, if you are an energy producer in western Pennsylvania, uh, you know, there's the opportunity to make profits out there if you can get that energy to market. Uh, so I do think, and we're starting to see increased drill counts, rig counts in the United States. Um, it's been a slow process, and, you know, there's a lot of um, productive capacity that we lost because of the pandemic. Uh, but I do think that this will spur energy development activity, uh, both in the United States and other parts of the world, and that will help bring down energy prices over the longer run. Uh, but that being said, you know, I think it's going to be a rough six, nine months for consumers. I think it's going to be a rough six, nine months for businesses as they have to adjust to these higher energy prices before we see some of that uh, increased supply coming online. I, 
I have a question about uh, robotics and AI. You know, that's um, been spoken of today as one of the focuses going forward. Um, and pre-pandemic, robotics and AI had a huge impact on employment, um, employment needs as far as a developed workforce mm -hmm. and and the number of bodies and jobs that would be created. So um, can you speak to, um, you know, advances that are predicted or kind of being uh, assumed for the future with robotics and AI and its impact on employment? Yeah, so, so um, the question was about robotics, artificial intelligence, and I think in, you know, generally technology more generally on employment. Um, I, I think, if anything, that process is likely to accelerate in the near term. Uh, I think with the labor shortages that businesses are experiencing right now, they need to make their existing workforces more productive. They need to adjust to a structurally smaller workforce. So that gives businesses a much greater incentive to invest in these technologies that will allow their workers to be more productive over the longer run. Um, you know, I think about things like self-drive, you know, there's a big shortage of truck drivers out there, for example, now. Um, you know, if we can develop technologies that will allow for reduced need for truck drivers, then that will help alleviate labor shortages in that industry. That's occurring broadly throughout the economy. And I think if anything, that process has intensified with the pandemic. Now, it's not going to be something that happens over a year or two. These are obviously very, very long-term prospects. They take place over decades. Um, so that, you know, in the short term, that's going to drive a lot of investment. Over the longer run, you know, we have to think about as a society what that means for the future of employment in the United States. We as a society benefit from investments in technology that allow workers to be more productive, to increase output per worker over the longer run. At the same time, that does result in lost job opportunities for some people, particularly people with less formal education, younger people in the workforce, and so forth. So we need to figure out not just how do we develop these technologies, but how do we deal with the distributional implications of these technologies? How do we make sure that people have access to training? How do we make sure that people have access to health insurance? All of those factors so that we can have a 21st century workforce and a 21st century economy. Any questions coming in from online? Yeah, hey guys. Um, so one online was uh, having shortages of labor. Um, what economic or uh, incentive policies uh, do we need to invite immigrants and refugees to be an active sector for labor and employment in Pittsburgh? Um, that is a great question. Um, you know, we have seen much lower levels of immigration in the United States in, you know, recent years compared to where we were even, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and you think about it in Pittsburgh. We, you know, you think about the steel mills and all the immigrant labor that came in. Uh, both, you know, internal migration from within the United States, but migrants coming from Eastern Euro Central Europe to, to the Pittsburgh area, and how that made it really built the Pittsburgh economy during the steel uh, era. Um, you know, I am very discouraged by the fact that we have not been able to figure out immigration policy in the United States. Uh, I think that most people agree that higher levels of immigration would benefit the U.S. economy over the long run. We can talk about the balance between skilled labor and unskilled labor, all of those things. Uh, but I think, you know, business people, they say, look, we need workers. Uh, we want to bring in people, you know, we bring in people to the United States in, in Pittsburgh is a great example. We bring in people from overseas to learn in our universities, and then we send them back. That is a huge waste of talent. And we would be much better served by keeping these people in the United States, by keeping these people in the Pittsburgh area. Um, so I think that immigration could be a huge part of the solution, uh, but I'm very discouraged by the fact that our political system cannot seem to, uh, you know, uh, come up with a way to increase legal immigration uh, that benefits our economy over the longer run. And again, as we were talking about with the, the, the technology issue, we need to think about the distributional implications of that because, you know, it could be that it hurts some native 
uh, unskilled, uh, less skilled labor in the United States. But we, you know, we there are ways to get around that. But I really wish that we could get our um, uh, immigration system in, fixed. And you know, that's one thing that you can do is you can uh, write to your elected officials, contact them, and, and encourage them to work out a solution so that we can have a highly skilled, larger workforce over the longer run, uh, and that we can benefit from these people who come to Pittsburgh, who come to the United States to learn, keep them here, keep their skills in the U.S. economy to add to long-run economic growth. Bob, how are we doing on time? Are we doing okay? I have another one quick question. Uh, any sense when this growth cycle uh, will end? Uh, so the question is, when will this growth cycle end? Well, let's go back to that chart. Oops. Let's go back to that chart all the way at the beginning. And, um, you know, the previous expansion lasted more than 10 and a half years. That was the longest expansion in U.S. economic history. And as I mentioned, um, the reason we got a recession was not because of there were problems in the economy, uh, but because of something external to the economy. So, um, you know, it's possible... I'm not going to say that it's likely to happen, but it's possible that we could enjoy another decades-long cycle. Now, that being said, I do think that the outlook is trickier now uh, than it was even a few months ago. Uh, you know, the, the continued high inflation, you add on top of that the risks uh, with even higher inflation because of the Ukraine situation, uh, the potential drag on U.S. growth from what's going on in Europe, from higher energy prices. Um, and I do think that, again, I think that the odds that the Federal Reserve makes a mistake uh, are higher now than they were even a few months ago. That being said, I do think that if the Fed can get through this next six, nine months, to bring inflation down while allowing the expansion to continue, I do think that that sets us up for perhaps another five or six years of economic growth. But I think the trickiest part is going to be the near term 2022. The odds of a potential misstep by the Federal Reserve are certainly, you know, higher now than they were six months ago even. Um, and so I'm, I, I still think the Fed can do it. I have great faith. Uh, I think Chair Powell has done an excellent job. I think the other Fed officials take their jobs very seriously. I'm hopeful that they can figure this out, but I do think we face a, a difficult challenge in the next six, nine months. But if we do get through that period, then I think we're set up for a period of extended growth after that. All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate the opportunity.